We're going to begin the conversation um, with some understanding of uh, some, some people who know a great deal about how we got here to help us understand how did we get in such a deep hole, what are the problems, where did it come from, and how do we get out? Nancy McLean and Neil Simon both bring long-term analysis to this question. They dig deep into structural cause and effect, the need for the long view, both to understand what went wrong and to understand what we need to do now. Nancy McLean is the William Chaffee Professor of History and Public Policy at Duke University and the award-winning author most recently of Democracy in Chains. It's available in our bookstore. It won the national, it was nominated a finalist at the National Book Award, winner of the Los Angeles Times Book Award, Current Affairs, and Lillian Smith Book Award. She's a historian of citizen movements and their impact. Neil Simon is a four-time CEO, a big success each time, building financial services businesses with value for many, many people, a two, uh, 2018 candidate for the U.S. Senate in Maryland. He's the author of the upcoming book, I've had a sneak preview, I urge you to read it as well. Contract to Unite America, 10 Reforms to Reclaim Our Republic. He serves on the board of Unite America, and we're grateful to Unite America for their sponsorship of this conference, and the Bipartisan Policy Center. These two outstanding books and authors uh, are of great value to all of us, and, I, and I'm grateful for them being here and look forward to this conversation. Consistent with our approach at American Promise, uh, well, Nancy and Neil share uh, a view that the problems go back a long way and are structural. They're very different. They come from different backgrounds, different perspectives, different politics. And uh, I think they think for themselves. I know they think for themselves and um, encourage us to do the same. And so we're going to continue, as we have throughout this conference, in conversations and engagement with each other without feeling that we all have to be on the same page on everything and figuring out how to move forward on the big things that we need to do. Let me begin with you, Nancy. Um, Professor McLean, um, so good to see you. Thank you for being here. Your book, Democracy in Chains, suggests that the roots of the current crisis in our democracy really go back around 60 years right here in Virginia. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about that. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, let me say thank you, Neil. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Jeff, uh, for inviting Neil and I to this event. And thank you all for the vital work that you're doing. It has just been so exciting and energizing to be here and to hear about it. Uh, so yes, I think uh, in a story Doris Kearns Goodwin, as a fellow historian, would appreciate, uh, I was pursuing a very different story than the one I ended up with. Um, when I started the research that became Democracy in Chains, uh, I had never heard of the two figures who come to loom large in it. Charles Koch, uh, whose name I'm sure is familiar to you, and someone else whose name is probably not familiar to you, James McGill Buchanan, the first uh, Nobel Prize winning economist from the South. And the story that I was pursuing was the story of the massive resistance of Southern states to the Brown versus Board of Education decision and the leadership role that Virginia was playing in that. One core element, and in fact the keystone of the arch of that massive resistance, was uh, using tax funded vouchers for private schools that would be beyond the reach of the federal courts. So that was the core of the massive resistance program. And I was surprised to find folks that we would think of as free market, pro-capitalist, free market fundamentalist, you know, whatever choose your term, uh, to term you choose, uh, rallying to the side of Virginia in this, including Milton Friedman um, uh, and uh, Friedrich Hayek, if you've heard of him, and this figure, uh, James Buchanan. So that really intrigued me to see uh, advocates of economic liberty essentially siding with the most arch segregationists in the South. And so I started digging in and pulling on that thread. And to make a long story short, it led me to this school of thought that has been weaponized by the Koch donor network work in order to transform our politics, as my book puts it, to enchain democracy. And what's really important, I think, for us to understand is that this, from the very beginning, as it or I should say as it developed, too, was a self-consciously minority project from people who knew that their views would lose out as America became a more inclusive, robust democracy. Repeatedly, they were repelled at the polls, uh, and people they thought would carry their agenda 
didn't because they knew it would make them unpopular. So they turned to a strategy of changing the rules, of infusing dark money uh, in politics, and actually of deliberate disinformation on things like climate change and promoting the myth of voter fraud to justify voter suppression. So it was a long and winding sort of circuitous tale, but it really uh, helped me to see that that late 1950s moment was the crucible of this uh, radical right that we see today that has been so vigorous and has used dark money to such devastating effect. And, and so, the, so it seems lesson one, this has been a long-term yes. project. Um, is it fair to say lesson two is uh, not everybody agrees with our view that more voters are a good thing, participation's a good thing, yes. uh, Americans being represented is a good thing. Is that, Absolutely. What, I mean, like, can you help us understand that a little more? Like, yeah. what are the motivations yes. for our fellow Americans, which they are, and obviously smart people who built uh -huh. businesses and were at, you know, studying at um, University of Virginia or some of the universities of, of, yeah. of the state. Why, why are they doing this? Yeah, this took me a long time to understand and wrap my ra mind around a lot of uh, reading of the, of the sources, the writings and speeches of these people and going through the archives. But basically what I learned is exactly what you're saying. I don't know how many people here know Heather McGee, the brilliant um, former head of Demos. She has a wonderful video called What If All Americans Voted, <laughs> right? About the kind of society we would be living in. And a great democracy reformer that you may know also, Miles Rapoport, after he read me, read my book, he sent the video and he said, I realize now that this thing that we see as good would be a nightmare for James Buchanan and Charles Koch, right? The world that we would have if everyone voted. And so, uh, yes, we're talking about uh, people, and I am not exaggerating here, Common Cause agrees on this, who actually ultimately seek to change our constitution through a constitutional convention uh, that would radically restrict what we the people uh, can do. And Common Cause has called this uh, the, the most serious threat to democracy flying almost completely under the radar and said that it's an effort to undo the policy, the policies of the 20th century, basically things like Social Security, Medicare, um, many of our public health measures, environmental protection, and so forth. So this is really a serious, well-integrated plan, literally hundreds of organizations now working on it, which you know I could share information with you at another time. Why are they doing this? Reasons I think of both uh, libertarian dogma, Charles Koch is a very committed uh, libertarian, uh, and it's an ideology. I think there's lots of ordinary people who identify with aspects of libertarianism, but for the folks who are running these organizations and pushing this agenda, libertarianism is really ultimately about economic liberty. It's about liberty for the wealthiest taxpayers who don't agree with their fellow citizens, and it's about the liberty of corporations to be free from regulation. So in Koch's case, the fact that this huge enterprise that he's built in Koch Industries is rooted in the fossil fuel sector is no coincidence, right? And the libertarian ideology and the commitment to maintaining the freedom of the fossil fuel industry to do what they are doing to our planet come together in this drive to restrict the electorate. What I think is, one last thing I'll say that's most interesting though, I, I think the single most important finding of my research is to see the architects of this, James Buchanan, Charles Koch and others saying again and again that they understand they are a permanent ideological minority. And that's why they're pursuing things in the way they are, through these stealth measures, through rigging our political system with things like the most extreme gerrymandering we've ever seen in our political history to misrepresent the voters, voter suppression, the destruction of labor unions and effective public health lobbyists like Planned Parenthood. So it's a very, very serious operation, but it actually bizarrely comes from them feeling vulnerable in a democracy where majority rule applies. Let me bring Neil into the conversation. Neil Simon. Um, so you have uh, also a view that this has been a long-term problem. It's been coming on for decades. It has um, created structures and barriers to effective governance, to representation of Americans, to fair elections. Um, but you point to different causes, different villains. And um, can you tell us about that? Sure. So first, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks to all of you for being here. It's 9.30 in the morning on a Sunday, and you guys are all up talking about how we can improve our democracy. So, um, yeah, cheer, cheer for all of you. Um, let, let me start by telling you a quick story about one of my companies, because I think it'll give you a little insight into me and into how I think about politics. So 
In 2002, I started what became my most successful business. It was called Highline. It was an investment management business. And the first thing I did is I hired a number of really smart analysts. And they had two jobs. One was to invest money, and one was to communicate with our investors who wanted to know what we were up to. And we did pretty well. And after a few years, we had managed a few hundred million dollars. And then I had an idea. I said, maybe we can grow even faster. What if I change the incentive structure for these analysts? And so we put in an incentive for them to bring in new business. So what do you think happened? A couple of them actually brought in some new business and were able to make some more money. Most of them failed because it wasn't what they were good at. And so after a little while, we changed it back. Now, if I ask those analysts, they will all tell you that they did exactly the same things, that none of those incentives changed their behavior. But the result I saw, there were two other results that we saw when we had that incentive in place. One was that our investment performance got worse relative to our competitors. And the other is that our retention rate, which had always been 100%, started going down to about 96%. So they didn't even realize they were doing things differently, but they were. They responded to that incentive structure. Same smart people doing what they thought were the same things. So why am I telling you this? So think about our political system. So if you're a smart, rational person and you want to be elected to the House of Representatives, what do you do? What are your incentives? So you look at the election landscape and you look at the general elections and the first thing you figure out is that only about 15% of those House races are competitive. And the pollsters will tell you that in the other 85%, one party or the other has such a big advantage that it's, the general election is not really meaningful. So now you say, okay, 85% of the time, what do I need to do to win? I need to win a primary. So you look at who votes in those primaries. And it's about 20 to 25% of American registered voters that vote in congressional primaries. And this is a little bit of an overgeneralization, but it's mostly the 10% most liberal Democrats voting in that primary and the 10% most conservative Republicans voting in that primary. So every incentive you have is to appeal to one of those bases. And that's why we hear what we hear on television all day long, every day, those appeals to one base or another. There is almost no incentive when you're running for office to talk about collaboration and compromise to try to get things done for the American people. And then money makes this worse. So when I, when I was a candidate for the Senate, I would receive these forms from different PACs, um, and they would ask you to attest to how you would vote on a number of issues. Take one side or the other. And if you do that, presumably you get some funding from the groups. Now, what if I looked at things in a little more nuanced way? What if I, for example, on immigration, thought that we should keep families together, we should have a path to citizenship for law-abiding residents who have been here for a really long time, but I also thought, you know what, we should have increased border security, and we have a half a million people coming into the country illegally every year, and maybe we should reduce that. Or what if I was generally against tax increases, but I thought we needed to invest in our infrastructure, and I might be okay with a gas tax. Or I'm concerned about climate, I might be okay with a carbon tax. How do I fill out those forms? I don't fit into one box on one side or one box on the other side. So everything in the, the system, the way the general elections work, primary elections work, the way money works, and a lot of my other forms are about this also, everything in the system pushes our candidates to the two extremes. And that's why we end up where we are today, where we get very little done on almost anything of importance. We see gridlock and partisanship and divisiveness. And so just to sum up, so I'm not someone who looks at our broken government and concludes that we have a lot of terrible people in our government. I do not think that that's true. I think we have a lot of good people who like their jobs, who are rational and they're responding to a completely perverse set of incentives that we've allowed to evolve over the last few decades. And thank you, it's, um, it's two different starting points um, ending up in dysfunction and broken government. So Neil, you uh, have a wonderful subtitle to your book, 10 Reforms That Can Save Our Republic. So there's an answer to this. Um, tell us a little bit about some of those reforms, what they would do, and what America would look like if we can achieve those reforms. What, what does success look like? Sure, so I wanna 
make sure everyone here can sleep tonight. One of the reforms is Jeff's 28th <laughs> Amendment, so that's definitely one of them, and we, we, need, we, we, need, we need to do that. Um, and actually, two of the 10 are about campaign finances. There's this one, and then there's another one about transparency in campaign finances, because I think we all deserve to know whose money is being spent on all those ads that we see every day. And it, and it is too easy to hide it. And the great thing is that there's a moment in time right now when we actually might be able to do something about both these campaign finance issues. Because historically, one party or the other has perceived a big advantage. But dark money is now 54% Democratic. So not, neither party has a big advantage in dark money right now. So we actually might be able to get something done in there. So two of them are about campaign finance reforms. Um, six of them are electoral reform issues, things that a lot of you are involved with and fighting for. And then the last two would encourage better behavior from people once they're elected in office. So they, um, things like the rules in the House and the Senate. Yeah, and ter you have a term limits amendment as well. Term so. limits, so I consider that an electoral reform yeah. initiative. Term limits, so every one of the reforms in my book is supported by at least 60% of Americans. Term limits is the single most popular one. 83% of Americans support term limits. And if you talk to the other 17%, the people who don't support term limits, I think they generally fall into two camps. The first one is, I'll ask people, so you're not for term limits, so do you think our, our president should be allowed to the elected four or five, six, seven terms. They'll say, no, that doesn't sound like good. What about the 36 governors where we have term limits? And they'll generally back off. That's half of them. The other half who are against term limits, they're all the legislators. <laughs> they're all, that's, um, and and so, can I ask very quickly the vision of what America looks like? We do all 10 of those. Right. What, do we, so, what does government look like? What do the people look like? What does the country look like? If we could do all 10, or even if we could just do a few of them, it would change the incentive structure in our politics. What it does is now, someone running for office, rather than have every incentive to appeal to one base or the other and scream angry messages and run negative ads all day long, you have an incentive to work together, to collaborate, because you're appealing to what one study called the hidden majority, the silent middle of this country that is tired of this red versus blue warfare and wants us to collaborate and work together and actually get things done on healthcare costs, on education, on infrastructure, on immigration, control our debt, you know, whatever your issue is, climate, we, we are getting almost nothing done on anything. And most of America, sadly, is resigned to this at this point. They're throwing up their, their hands in frustration. So I think what it does is it changes the incentive structure for people running for office for the first time or even if they're running for re-election. Great, and let me ask Nancy. A similar question. First, though, um, where's the common ground with Neil on the 10 reforms or some reforms? And what is the America that you see when we achieve these reforms? Yeah, so, uh, so I think we, we are agreed that we are at a point of great dysfunction and, and impasse. Um, and I agree that the incentive structures are bad. And I particularly support uh, Neil's uh, backing of the 28th Amendment and also independent redistricting. I think we differ on some of the other measures because what I see happening is not hyperpolarization that's equal on both sides, but rather what the um, political political scientists, bipartisan, Thomas Mann and Norman Ornstein, uh, called asymmetric polarization that's being driven by a Republican party that is, I mean, both parties are too um, uh, obligated to the donors. I totally agree on that. But the Republican party in particular has been captured by a set of donors who are arch right, particularly the Koch network uh, donors who are applying kind of brute force against any Republican elected official who doesn't toe the line. So um, that I think is why we see all the elected officials being so quiet about the violations that, to our Constitution that are happening right now. So I know that's a point of difference with some others, um, but, but I think um, looking at the historical roots of that dysfunction, which they describe in their book, it's even worse than it looks, um, it is really important. Getting the diagnosis right is important to getting the right treatment plan. That said, I think even if we just did those two things of getting money, particularly corporate dark money, out of politics and independent redistricting, 
I think we'd be having very different public conversations and we would be able to move on all of this impacted public agenda that Neil mentioned that ordinary Republican voters and Democratic voters and independents agree on. It's astonishing how, many, how much agreement there is on the issues facing our country. People want clean air and water. They want our public schools better supported. They want the teachers better paid. They want us to, to, to act on uh, uh, all kinds of things, including health care, but they're stopped because of this broken political system. So I think if we have that, what I envision is what this, we're supposed to have, which is a government of, by, and for the people, in which we can have governments that truly represent the citizenry uh, and that are full of fresh ideas and strategies for action on the things that concern us. Great. So we, we just have a, a, a minute or two, but I, I know um, we've been talking a lot, almost everybody in this room and most of us have didn't plan to be uh, you know, leading a reform movement together, all of us. Um, Nancy McLean, a scholar, uh, usually looks at what happened and how it happened and tries to help us understand. Neil Simon builds businesses and um, you know, it, um, doesn't have to do this. <laughs> He's got a family, it's got a, uh, lots of things to do. And yet, here you are um, saying it's gone really bad and there's hope that there's, there's solutions and you're rolling up your sleeves to make it happen. What motivates you? Why do you do this, Nancy? Yeah, um, I, what motivates me is that I honestly believe as a historian that we are at an all hands on deck emergency for our democracy. I don't think this moment is as dramatic as the 1860s or the 1930s, but I believe it's as consequential. Um, I believe that this is a grave, we're facing grave threats to our democracy, but I think it's also a time that we can renew it. And I guess at the deepest level, I'm motivated by the values I was brought up with. And by the way, my dad was a Republican voter until he, his death in, in 2000, but we were were brought up um, uh, with honesty, integrity, and fairness as core values. And what is so um, unsettling to me in this Koch Network project I see is that it is in violation of those values because they will say euphemistic things about the world they're trying to create, but the strategy that they've adopted, as I show in the book, is a stealth strategy, a stealth strategy that relies on systematic disinformation about some of the most crucial issues of our time, including what's happening to our planet, um, and also on rigging the rules and using this dark money in a bullying way to get elected officials to toe uh, a line that is not what the voters want. And so that, that kind of offends me. I teach the history of social movements. I believe that anybody who thinks they have a good idea has the right to build and organize to you know, promote that idea and to try to rally other people around it. But at the end of the day, it has to be about persuading the majority, right? And you have to be honest about what you're seeking. And if you're not honest, we're into a whole different terrain. So that, you know, you asked us this question earlier and I thought about it. And at the end of the day, I would have to say it's just standing up for the values that I was raised with and trying to prevent those from being violated in our public sphere. Great. Well, Neil, what, what motivates you? What gives you hope? Yeah, for me, I, I feel like we all have an obligation to try to leave our country better for our kids than what we got. And, and for years, Jen, who's here with me, and I would talk at our dinner table with our kids, and we've talked about different issues. And you know, one month it's immigration. And that month would go by and nothing would happen. And another month, it's, hey, we got all this traffic and we should be investing in infrastructure. And we talk about how the parties actually agree on this and nothing would happen. And then the next month, the debts in um, the news and we have $21 trillion of debt and we're explaining to our kids what that means to them. And the next month, it's about the climate. And hey, we've known about this for a long time and nothing happens. And so not only are we leaving our kids with all of these things unresolved, but on top of that, we're leaving them a government that is less functional than it's ever been. That is not fair to our kids. And that's really what motivates me. And so I did not think, five years ago, I did not think I would run for office. I hadn't even thought about it. I ended up being encouraged by a number of people. And I certainly didn't think I'd end up writing the book, but it really is motivated because I think we need to fix our system. We need to structurally fix our government. Otherwise, things are just getting worse and worse. And we're going to be leaving a country for our kids that's not as good as the one we found, which I don't think is fair. Thanks.
Well, thank you. That's all we have time for, but thank you so much. Neil Simon, Nancy McLean, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. So grateful. Thanks, Neil.